Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today. Lovely day outside, isn't it? Great to have uh, friends and guests. Glad to, you came out to worship this morning, and uh, just so great to be here today. I trust you enjoy, will enjoy the music, and a big thank you to the worship team who uh, put this on every week. A uh, uh, lot of practice and dedication on their part, so uh, I think we can give them a big round of applause. Can we say thank you for all they've done? Yeah. I want to start off, uh, call the worship from Psalm 30. It says, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from growing down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people, and praise his holy name. Let's pray. Lord, we come today. We thank you that you're the kind of God that hears our prayers. You're the kind of God that rescues and, and, uh, and delivers and and Lord, so we want to come here today, we want to worship you, we want to praise your name. And I know different people uh, come from different backgrounds as we walk in here in this place. Uh, uh, maybe we're new, maybe we've been coming here for a while. Uh, maybe we're not sure where we are when it comes to God and, and, and how you made all things. I pray, Lord, that during this time of worship, that you would reduce our anxiety. And Lord, as we focus in on you, that uh, we would... See the things of this world fade away and find a hope and a peace that transcends our situation. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. You can stand together as the worship team leads in song. Hopefully we don't blow up. That'll be good. that was, but it was a gremlin. <laughs> Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. How I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord. I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And blessed be your name when the sun shining down. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, love the pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Because every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Will you give and take away? Choose to say, Lord bless. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say.
seated. The scripture this morning is in Luke chapter 24, uh, picking it up after Jesus resurrected in the last part of the gospel of Luke, uh, verses 36 down to the last chapter in the book, verse 53. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they had saw a ghost. Remember, he had just died and was buried. They weren't expecting to see him again. Uh, so he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Let's pray. Lord, I, my prayer today is for those of us sitting here. 
that you would open up our hearts and our minds to your word. And not only to your word, but to your word that points to you. Lord, I pray that today we would be drawn closer to you. Uh, we sit here today worshiping you last Sunday, remembering your resurrection. And here we see you appearing to people. And it's almost impossible to believe except that you were God who walked on this earth. A claim that some people reject. A claim that we here today embrace and worship you, our risen Lord. Lord, I pray that whatever we're going through, whatever things that we're suffering, whatever he health ailments we have, financial difficulties we have, questions about the future that we have, may we be reminded that you were crucified. You know what it's like to suffer. You call us to carry a cross. Lord, you're the kind of God who understands the things that we go through, that we're walking with, the questions that we have, the complexities of life, temptation, health issues, being made fun of, being beaten up, being ridiculed, even being abandoned. On the cross, you said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You understand what the sorrow and grief of this life is like. And so as we come today to worship you, I pray for healing. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for peace. We pray for joy to, to flood into our hearts that we would know that you're a God of love, a God of holy love who accepts us as sinners and yet transforms us into something beautiful. And so, Lord, as we come today as broken people, we pray that although we might feel shattered, that you would make us whole again as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll let the team continue to lead us in worship. Jesus, you're the Lamb. 
that song. We had some excellent notes there, didn't we? That was great. I don't know if uh, some of you have ever heard of the, uh, the band Linkin Park, and I'm not a spokesperson for them, but uh, recently I was listening to one of their, their songs. They were a top rock band the last two decades. They sold over 100 million records worldwide, and uh, they won a bunch of awards. Uh, the last record they released was called uh, One More Light, and it was based on the, the same name of the song. I was recently listening to it, and uh, uh, the chorus of the song struck me. Everyone understand a culture and appreciate where people are at. Artists and musicians have a way of capturing uh, where 
where society is. And uh, uh, here are some of the words of the song. I, I can't do justice to how uh, the lead singer sang it, but um, uh, sadly he took his life in 2017. But um, uh, it says, Who cares when someone's time runs out? If a moment is all we are, we're quicker, quicker. It's that little bit he sung, if a moment is all we are. And uh, it stuck out to me because it's a popular uh, belief that comes up in movies and all over the place that seems to permeate our culture that we're only here for a short time and, and there's nothing else after death. That's just, this, this is it. All we are is a moment is something that at least they're, they're flirting with the idea. And in my heart it leaped out to me and I just said, no, there's, there's, there is so much more not only to this life, but the next one to come. We aren't just a moment. There is there's an afterlife. There's an afterlife. And how do I know this? So you're just making that stuff up. No, I, I know it based on the passage that I just read earlier. If you think about it, think about the significance of the scripture that we just read about the history of what took place here. You have Jesus who was murdered, he was executed, he, he died, then he was buried, and who in turn is walking around and talking to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. So he didn't just get down from the cross and go to Kashmir. It might sound odd for you to hear that. That's, actually, that's an actual theory. Um, and no, they didn't hang him uh, on the cross and let the vultures or animals eat him, which they sometimes did. He was buried and placed in a tomb. And now this is happening in the passage we just read. He, he clearly resurrected from the dead. Now we don't know exactly where Emmaus was. It was about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. In any case, on this road to Emmaus, they eventually get to town. And uh, he's walking. He's physically walking with them. With two people that come from verse 9 of the chapter, whoever they were. We don't know exactly which two. They clearly know someone is with them and treating them like a real human. He's, he's talking, he's making sounds that other people can hear and they're responding to it. Jesus then shows them his hands and, and his feet for them to look at and then touch, which revealed his wounds from his crucifixion, which is why they knew it was him and it wasn't just anybody, anybody else. He then asks them for some food. He picks it up, he chews it, and he swallows it right in front of them. They thought they saw, they saw some sort of ghost, some sort of spiritual manifestation of Jesus. But no, they saw a resurrected Jesus in bodily form. The same Jesus who died three days earlier. Jesus with real skin and bones. There is life after death. And we see it in the appearance of Jesus Christ. We read about it from human eyewitness testimony. This is so important. This is so important. Which would be sufficient in any court case in our land. For the Jewish world, two witnesses verified a claim. And we know that from Deuteronomy 17.6. Well, two of them were on the road with him. That, that's not a coincidence that there was two eyewitnesses verifying that Jesus did rise from the dead. Their interaction with him was no fluke. Jesus conquered the grave. Eternal life as verified by witnesses on earth. Now we sit here today, and I know that some of us, I've kind of been glued to it throughout the week, watching the coverage of the, uh, the Derek Chauvin trial on TV and the death of George Floyd. It's a tragic tragic case, a monumental case being tried in the U.S. right now. The eyewitnesses who were there in real time should be listened to, right? As, as the prosecution gives out their, their case, they're listening to people who were right there in real time watching what happened to this man on the street. Not the people who come in after and try to change the story or spin it one way or the other. The camera footage doesn't lie, does it? So what I'm saying is that real people in real time 
as written down and, and handed to us, and we learn about in Scripture, saw Jesus, touched Jesus, ate with Jesus, heard Jesus. And not just many occurrences, and there were many occurrences after his death. There's life after death. Six days ago, about well, six days ago now, in the Globe and Mail, uh, a lady by the name of Kathy, it was, a, it was a wonderful little article that she wrote up. She was just being honest, and we'd have different convictions, but she wrote an honest, honest article about life after death and how she eventually came to believe in it. She writes this. She said, you know, deep within my heart, I believe that once we died, that was it. My scientific training as a respiratory therapist meant I thought that a person who claimed to see the bright lights during a near-death experience was simply suffering from hypoxia as their brain and body shut down. But what happened to Kathy, as she writes, is that her boyfriend Dave died. And long story short, in her grief, she went to a psychic. That's what she did. She went to a psychic to try and make a connection with him. And she was motivated by the TV show uh, Long Island Medium. I don't know if you've ever heard it or maybe you've seen it, but it's, it's popular these days. Anyhow, she claims to have made a connection uh, as the psychic told her intimate things that only Dave would know and other things about her family that the psychic couldn't possibly have known. And at the end of the article, she writes that there's another side of life after we die. Now, as I share that, what I'm after is that common ground with Kathy that there is life after death. We don't just seek to exist. Now, as for going to mediums or psychics or uh, tarot cards, that's something that Christians should avoid. It's been a message down through the ages that, that God's people were to avoid those types of things. In Deuteronomy 18, it says, Let no one of you be found who practices sorcery or interprets omens or engages in witchcraft or cast spells, or who is a medium or spiritist who consults the dead. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. But at least some common ground with her as she's trying to wrestle and journey through this thing called life, that there's a recognition that there's more to life than just the years that we're alive here on this earth. Something that the lead singer from Lincoln Park was flirting with in his song, and that so many people do. And by the way, this belief in this doctrine is impacting a lot of things. If this is all there is, I mean, do whatever you want. If this is all there is, then we'll live however we want. That underlying uh, teaching and, and philosophy in our culture is impacting a lot of things, even when it comes to public policy changes in Canada. It's a popular thought. Although a few things I'm seeing is might even be changing within the science realm as well. For the Christian community and these followers of Jesus, one of the closest creeds we have to the time of the death of Jesus is in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7. It says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, which he, by that uh, Paul means Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he also appeared to me as to one abnormally born. The number of appearances, the number of people who saw him, it's not something made up. It can't just be hallucination. Jesus is alive. There's life after death. What Paul is doing here with the church in Corinth is he's not trying to prove the resurrection of Jesus. But in that church, they were asserting that there was no resurrection from the dead. Something common took place even in their city in Corinth many years ago. Paul says, no, listen, Jesus rose. And so because of that, he continues on in the rest of the passage to explain that since Jesus did, all who belong to him will live as well. In this passage today, Jesus explains to them that his new resurrected body 
was going to become theirs. That he, that he uh, fulfilled everything that was written in the, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, all the Old Testament that he had to suffer and rise from the dead. And then he had something that becomes the church's calling before he ascends. It's a really important little verse. But he says, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. After that, he blesses them, and he's taken up to heaven. Now, his being taken up to heaven and receiving power from on high is something we'll get into uh, next week as we get into a new series going through the book of Acts. We're finishing off Luke here today. We've been actually walking with Jesus through the Gospel of Luke uh, since September of 2019. I had to kind of stop and reflect on that, but uh, it's been a guide to me and to us as a church family as we've moved our church into the new building and as we've gone through a chunk of COVID-19 going through the Gospel of Luke. God is faithful. But as I close off this morning, it's that first part. He said, repentance for the forgiveness of sins we preach in his name to all nations before he went to be with the Father. Folks, there's life after death, but the destination is not the same for everybody. God wants the destination to be, to be with him, what we call glory or heaven, but not everyone will choose to go there. Not everyone will put their faith in Christ. When I say that, one of the first things people will think of is how come? How come? Like, why, why is that the case? Why can't we all just, just go there? And God wants that to happen, and it's why he sent his son. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Jesus came to save the world. Jesus came to save you. He loves you, and he, he wants to have a relationship with you. And he will save it by becoming a sin offering. He'll take on your sin and your punishment so that you don't have to suffer for it eternally. However, through the life and ministry of Jesus, one of the things that's a common theme that we've learned is that only those who believe and follow the Lamb will have their sins forgiven and the promise of eternal life. And that's been clear throughout. You have to repent and trust in Christ to save you. You don't have to be perfect. That's not the call. But to repent, meaning to turn your life around and reprioritize everything to the way of Jesus. Repent, it's a Hebrew word. It goes back millennia. But it's to no longer have allegiance to the powers of this world, to the convictions and beliefs of this world, but instead to serve the living and true God, to become a follower of Jesus, his disciple, his, his imperfect, struggling at times person of faith. And they struggle. Just read about it. The apostles uh, clearly struggled. Jesus had a, had, a, had a group of people who followed him through his whole ministry who were outcasts. They were they were losers in their society. They were the sick. They were proud people. They were made up of every demographic, young, old, rich, poor, sick, or healthy. The common denominator is that they knew that they needed a Savior. And in that is a message of hope to the world, a message truly of inclusion and of being a part of a family that transcends this world. It's not divided by politics. It's not divided by skin color. It's not divided by age. At least it shouldn't be. At least it shouldn't be. The only group that was excluded by Jesus are, are those who didn't think they were sinners and didn't need a savior. The religious elite. Our purpose as a church our commission from the Lord himself, I repeat, it's from the Lord himself, is to communicate this truth down through the ages until he returns. The repentance of sins and the guarantee of eternal life through faith in Christ. To teach people to repent, to follow life and teachings of Jesus in a world that will teach people different lives they can live, different beliefs they should have, different convictions they must assimilate to, 
But here we teach the way of the cross. The way of the cross. The path that leads to and reflects the character of our resurrected Lord himself. At its heart, while we live at peace as best we can in our world, and you know, we, we try to serve Jesus as best we can in Canada, we do that in the midst of a lot of modern-day movements. Um, we sit at a, table, at a table with all kinds of different voices that have different opinions than us, who don't have to agree and aren't necessarily going to agree with us, but we don't have to agree nor do we have to follow them as well. Beliefs and convictions that one of which I've mentioned in the message so far today, that there's no life after death. There is. And how we live today matters. As we speak the truth in love. Graciously loving, being compassionate, we communicate the way God is guiding us to live and do our best to live it ourselves as fallen people who are teaching our children and encouraging one another in our faith as God's, as God's family. And the thing is, it's, it's for everybody. I don't know, you might be sitting here today and think, that's nice, I'm not a church person. Um, the idea is not to be a church person. The idea is, is to follow Jesus, and that includes everybody. Anybody can do it. Anybody can start it at any time. Begin that relationship. I can help you with that. But the whole message of Jesus is a celebratory thing. It's joy. And it's a wrestling thing for some folks, and that's okay. It takes time. It's a message of hope that God came to save you, that God wants to help you, that there's actual forgiveness from the God who made you. And so Luke will close his gospel where he started, for us almost two years ago, uh, by praising God in the temple. Well, Luke began with Zechariah, who went to the temple and heard the word of the Lord. I trust that you've heard the word of the Lord, have taken it to heart, and have learned that there's more to this life, that there is life after death, an eternity that compels you to live in light of it today. And maybe that's something new to you, for you this morning as you come in here today, but think about it. What if, if there was life after death, and that went on for eternity, would that change how you live now? And if it did, what changes would you make? I did some of my initial studies in business. Uh, and you want to invest in things that matter, that give you the ultimate return. Why invest in, in things and something that will just fade away when you should invest in eternity? I mean, if it's true that he died and rose again, and one day we will give an account, and that there is life after death. And his word is the only word that matters. His judgment's the only one that matters. Wouldn't you want to do everything possible to please that one judgment, to please that king? You dedicate your whole life to him. For those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a while, I pray you find some comfort and encouragement that one day you will have a resurrected body. I joked a bit last week, I hope it's better than this one, right? This one tends to fall apart, I don't know. Every time you look in the mirror, eh, I don't know what, what's going on. Um, we have health issues. In his appearance, uh, he reveals to us that we're going to have new bodies. Somehow looking like our old ones, I'm not sure, but we will not perish because of what he did for us. John, the last book of the Bible, heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. There's a place of Sabbath, of eternal rest coming, for those who've served the Lamb. So I pray that you'd find encouragement if you've been serving him. If you haven't or that's a new idea for you to have a relationship with Jesus, uh, I'd encourage you to, to think about that more. And if there is life after death, what does that mean for you now? And know that you always have a friend in Jesus.
Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we come today. I thank you for that message of hope, that there's something beyond this world, a future life to look forward to and to live for. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And I pray for any of us, either influenced by or maybe we come here today, we believe that this is just it. There's nothing else beyond this world. That we would hear those words from these two witnesses who said, no, no, we saw Jesus. And for a group of people who then were martyred and started to live for the church, a new church, a new movement that continues on today, who know you and love you, Lord, I pray that everyone would know that they can be included in your forgiveness and in your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We can stand together as we close off with our final song. Well, we're going to sing about amazing grace. His amazing grace. off this morning. Uh, wondered, yes, the, we got a board meeting tomorrow night, uh, as well as the ABWs tomorrow afternoon. And I, I will let you know, too, there's another women's support group starting Sunday, April 25th 
at 4 p.m. That'll go for about uh, eight weeks. And so if you're interested in that, just contact the office uh, to sign up. And uh, I was mentioning last week, it's just all about how God loves you and wants to encourage you. And it's just meant to be a positive thing. So let's close off with uh, these words from Romans 15. Uh, and may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace by your faith in him until by the power of the Holy Spirit you overflow with hope. Amen. Have a wonderful week. God bless. Thank you.